I, I can barely hear if volume is low. All right. Let's go ahead and get started here. So, oh, where's the screens there? Let's see. So this is lecture number 21, the Wireless Communications Lab. So lecture number 20 was the midterm. So today we are going to transition from large scale into small scale fading. So I'm going to start out with an overview of small scale fading. You should be able to describe the factors that influence the small scale fading and justify the framing and slot structure implemented in a wireless system. Second, we're going to go into detail into two kinds of fading. One is frequency selective fading, and so you should be able to determine when a given propagation environment is frequency selective or flat. And then, similar for time selective fading, determine when a given propagation environment is time selective or non-time selective. Essentially, this is going to be time, invar time invariant or time varying. And the choice of these different small-scale fading environments determine the, the appropriate kind of signal processing model that we use. Okay, so first of all, um, I'll start off here with a couple announcements here. Uh, one, I apologize, but midterm number two is not graded, is actually not in my hands yet, um, but I should have it at least today and then I can start uh, grading it. So it'll be graded possibly by Wednesday or maybe by Wednesday and I'll hand it back after class on Wednesday later in the week. So that's midterm number two status. Um, the second thing is the for the graduate students the project proposals are graded but they're not entered in Blackboard. So I will have them though in my office. Um, I think I have them in my office. And then if you want to come by today and pick it up, that's fine, Not as long as I make sure to enter your grade in. So that's a couple announcements here. Now, before we get into um, small-scale fading, I want to review real quick the, um, this concept of large-scale fading and then also clarify something that um, I got confused about in the lecture that was recorded. And if you've watched that, you maybe you also had the same confusion there. So first of all, you know that the starting point here is this um, is this figure that plots received signal strength as a function of distance here. And if we make this measurement in any kind of wireless system, we'll see that there's a tremendous amount of variation as a function of distance. And then based on many measurement results, this average decay is, um, is fit to some sort of a distant dependent um, path loss model that, you know, in the dB scale ends up being equal to, you know, 10 log 10 of the distance plus you know, some other constants here, things like transmit power, reference distance, and so on here. And in the lecture number 19, we talked about this distance dependent path loss called the log distance model. We also talked about characterizing some of these variations here using a log normally distributed random variable, which is normally distributed in the log scale. And so we propose that a reasonable model for received power is something like this here. Transmit power, this is all in dB, minus path loss, where that path loss is equal to some loss at a reference distance here, which was LD0 
plus 10n log 10 of d plus this x sigma here, which is our log normally distributed random variable. Now, the place I was getting confused about in the lecture on the number 19 was, was this quantity here. And so I forgot to define this quantity precisely here. This L of D0 is the reference path loss. So you can think about that LD0 is equal to, we're just looking at this equation here, is equal to PT minus the received power at reference distance D0. And so if you don't have any information, this is again all in dB, if you don't have any information, you would compute this using the first free space equation. Now, why I wanted to point this out is that if you, if you keep this in mind here, when you go through and plug this in back over here, you end up with something that looks like PR of D is equal to PR of D naught, and then substituting in for that, minus 10N log 10 of D minus this x of sigma here. So when you, when, sorry, when you go through and substitute in, then what you see is that the path loss at distance d is equal to the path loss at distance d naught minus this distance dependent term minus or plus, sign doesn't matter here, this um, shadow fading component here. So that's the thing that I, I don't think I made clear in lecture number 19. So is there any question on this here? And also note the units here make sense because this is power and this is power. And these, um, actually the unit, yeah, you still have the problem with this D here anyways. Okay, so that's the, this is just the main thing to remember here. This is this first free space equation. Okay, so the characterizations that we focused on in lecture 19 was really, you know, these variations here were averaged on the orders of tens to hundreds of, of wavelengths. And now what we're going to do is we're going to focus on what's called the small scale characterization, which is the variation of the, the signal over on the or distances on the order of a wavelength, so over a very, very small um, distance. And so first we're going to talk about, you know, just a simple overview of this, how we parameterize small-scale fading. And so you should be able to describe the, the factors that influence small-scale fading and justify the framing and slot structure. So let's start off here with this um, fading regions. So this is small-scale fading. And so the way we, we typically think about small-scale fading is in terms of these two dimensions, which is essentially the extent of the variation in bandwidth and the extent of the variation in time. And so we usually draw a picture that looks something like this here. And so this is going to be, we can put signal bandwidth down here. And then let's say... We can put something like, you know, this should be symbol period or yeah. So let me let me leave that one blank for a second here. So we put like these kind of four quadrants here. Let's see. So this is bandwidth. Yeah, okay. So this is, sorry, symbol period here. And so then there's, there's kind of these four operating regimes here. 
and we label each of these here. So this one is called the selective slow fading. It's a signal bandwidth here. Let's see. And this is selective fast. This is flat and fast. And then this is flat and slow here. And so the parameters of the channel determine where this particular line is drawn here. And so what we're going to do in the latter part of this lecture here is we're going to characterize these two crossing points here and at least try to define these four different regions here of operation. So I'm going to explain essentially now what I mean by selective, non-selective, slow and fast and then give you kind of the equivalent system models that we might use. So the first one is this um, Frequency selective. So frequency selective here, this is the the option. This is selective. This is not selective. Selective, not selective here. So frequency selective fading refers to the smearing of a signal. due to multipath delays. So due to multipath propagation. So this is the, the, the variations in the received signal strength that comes from there being potentially different paths for the signal to get to the transmitter and receiver. So remember there's transmission, there's reflection, there's scattering. And the question here really is, you know, how, how different are the lengths of these paths relative to, let's say, the symbol period? So if the symbol period were very long, you know, say the symbol period was a thousand nanoseconds. You know, a thousand nanoseconds corresponds to a thousand feet of path difference. Then, if these path length differences were a few hundred feet, the different arriving parts of the signal will be roughly overlapping on the same symbol. So there wouldn't be that much smearing. And if you had like a one nanosecond symbol period corresponding to a very wide bandwidth, that would be hundreds of symbols of difference here. And so, because the symbol period is related to the symbol bandwidth, right? It's basically one over the, the symbol period. If you have a large bandwidth, the effects of these different delays is very significant. And that creates essentially frequency selective channel. You know, so our impulse response is not flat. It's characterized as some function of, you know, H of F here. And if it's extremely frequency selective, then we, then we would put it in this category over here. And so we're going to quantify this a little bit more precisely. But that's the intuition here. So frequency selective channel is essentially, you know, is, is the channel, is it something like, you know, alpha delta t minus tau? Or is it more of a, you know, sum of different paths where the, the path lengths are quite large here? So that's like, you know, the frequency selective concept. So you can see that, you know, if a channel is frequency selective, then we are going to need to design an equalizer. And if it's frequency flat, then we may not may, may be, able to, may be able to get away without an equalizer. Now, the second one here is time selective fading. So what this is, is this is the variation of the signal over time.
And this is due to mobility in the environment. And so this can be due to mobility of the transmitter, the receiver, or the reflectors in the environment. So it's TX, RX, or in the environment. And so what's happening here is with time selective fading, the propagation channel is, is varying over time. And the more quickly it varies, the more often we have to estimate it again if we want to equalize it. So this and then the extent of that variation determines, you know, whether we consider a channel to be fading fast or to be fading slow. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna to quantify as a function of the channel parameters when something is fast and when something is slow. Now, from a signal processing perspective, you can imagine that there's associated with each of these different quadrants is a different system model. So the importance of, of determining what kind of fading we have is going to determine essentially the kinds of signal processing algorithms that, that you would use at, at the receiver here. You know, if you're expecting frequency selective fading, your receiver needs to behave differently than if it's expecting frequency flat fading. So the equivalent system models here, and this is of course assuming synchronization has been um, accomplished here. So flat and slow is going to be something like, you know, y of n is equal to h s of n plus noise. So this is like the kind of model that we started out with here. And note that, you know, we have one, the channel is just captured by this gain and, and phase shift, and it affects many symbols. So it's flat and, and slow here. Now, let's keep going here. And the next one, which we've also dealt with extensively in class, would be like frequency selective and slow. And in that case, we, the channel has some sort of an impulse response with more than one tap. It smears our transmitted symbols. And of course we have noise there here. So frequency selective and slow, we get the smearing here. So frequency selective, so it has, you know, a non-flat frequency response. This one has a flat frequency response here. Frequency selective, we need equalization. Flat, we just need to invert that, that H there. So these are the two systems that we've dealt with for the most. And these are the most you know, popular ones in, in wireless. But there are, the other two quadrants also give other representations here. The flat fast fading model gives something like this here. Y of n is equal to H of n, S of n plus V of n. And the fast comes in because the channel is no longer time invariant. It's also varying potentially with every symbol. You know, we have to be careful here because this model is assuming that the channel changes quickly but not too fast. Because if it changes too fast, when we do things like um, integrate at the receiver to do the match filter, we're going to get something that's more complicated than this. So this is like some, this is like fast fading, but it's not super fast. But super fast, you can just imagine we're going to get something that's much more complicated here, and that'll look more like the last category. So this model here, the, the flat and fast model, is used. Um, is actually is not that common. You see it sometimes in uh, some very narrow band HF kind of uh, signals. Um, but it's not that common. And the reason is that it's actually very hard to communicate here, because even though we don't have to do equalization, if we want to do coherent modulation and detection, we have to be estimating this channel and somehow removing its effects, and that can be tricky. So then usually the solution here is you end up using some kind of a differential kind of a modulation here, so you don't have to estimate the channel. So this is very low rate. So. So then the sacrifice here is the signal processing is not that hard, but your performance is not very good. And so the final case is going to be selective 
and fast. And in this case, we have the um, input-output relationship of a frequency selective channel, except that we introduce a temporal index in there. So you see that we've got both time dependence and lag dependence here. So this is called a linear time varying system, as opposed to a linear time invariant system. And this last one here, this is, this is actually very hard to deal with. Um, from a signal processing perspective, you know, you have to estimate this channel at every time and then somehow equalize it here. There are ways to do it. If it's not varying that quickly, you can use an adaptive equalizer and some pilots. But generally, this is, this is really difficult to implement here. The places where this does come up, though, and it's really un unavoidable. It, it comes up in uh, underwater communication because underwater, the speed of um, propagation is the speed of sound underwater. It's so not the speed of light. It's very slow. And so things, um, it takes a long time, depending on the distance between transmitter and receiver, for your signal to get there. And so, you know, you're your transmitter receiver can move. Also, the, the water itself, there's turbulence, there's different um, thermal variations, so it creates distortion on the signal. So this is a typical model if you do underwater work that you have to deal with here. This also happens in HF for, for wider bandwidth signals, and that's because in HF, high frequency, you're, you're typically bouncing your signal off of the ionosphere. The ionosphere um, consists of this mass of particles that's moving around. And so that reflection off of the ionosphere also is varying over time. And depending on the bandwidth of your signal, you'll end up here, here. So, so these are the different um, signal models. Now, the question now is, is coming back to here, at what point is it selective or flat or slow and fast? And I have here a signal bandwidth, and I have here a symbol period. But the signal bandwidth is really just one over the symbol period. So, you know, the, these things are all connected here. So, dep so you could, depending on your signal bandwidth, you could push yourself into one of these different operating regions as well. And then that also affects the symbol period. Now, this is not exactly symbol period here because we'll see that we often want the channel to be constant over many symbols to be kind of block fading like we use in the lab. So this will actually be like 100 symbols or something. So now let's figure out how to, how to quantify these quantities here. Um, I guess before that, I mean, any question just about frequency or time selective here? No questions yet? Okay. All right, so let's focus on now, let's see, frequency selective fading. So with frequency selective fading, we want to determine if it's the channel can be, we can assume it's flat or selective. So that's the objective here. So we, to answer this question of if a channel is typically selective or, f or flat, we need some sort of um, information about the channel, something more than just a realization of the channel, because we know that the realization of the channel impulse response is going to vary over time and over space. And so we need some sort of an aggregate characterization of that impulse response, you know, not just the one on my desk, but if we were going to design a system to work well in this room, we would want to measure the impulse response at many different places in the room. So the, the quantity that's used in, in wireless to capture this is called the power delay profile. So power delay profile is, is something like this here. It's, it's a function of the lag. And it's typically written like the expectation of this time-varying impulse response 
where the expectation is taken over time here. And this expectation being, you know, sort of a theoretical quantity, in, in practice we might substitute in for the expectation with a, a sample average. We might instead replace this expectation with, let's say, a sum over n samples where we have n impulse response measurements in time. And so we take then and we average the squared values here. So just to illustrate, you know, so we, so we at, you could imagine here at some point in time, and this time could also be position, but, you know, at some, essentially you can think about these as being, we make measurements at, at different places at different points in time as well. And so you might have one realization of the impulse response that looks like this. You know, this is the magnitude squared, and then you have another one. Looks like that. Et cetera here. And so you average them all up to create this deterministic function, which is the power delay profile which typically, you know, doesn't have to, but it often looks something like this here. And what the power delay fro profile does is at this point in time here, let's call this S of tau 1, this gives you effectively the average power contributed by multipaths that are tau 1 seconds away from that first arriving path here. So this is something like this here. So this expectation of h of t comma tau 1. Yeah, so using that example before, I mean, if we ha this, this tau 1 here could be you know, let's say 100 nanoseconds, that it would tell you on average how much power arrives 100 nanoseconds after the first path comes in. From, for the, from the perspective of the power delay profile, we actually don't care about the, the signal um, propagation delay from the transmitter to receiver. We define zero here as the arrival time of the first path, and then everything else is based on the... Um, the subsequent arriving paths here. Okay, so that's like the, the power delay profile here. And so this, here we're treating our collection of impulse responses over time as some kind of a random quantity. And then we are taking an expectation and instead and, and ending up with this, which is a deterministic quantity here. So this is a this is a fixed function. It's not a it's not a varying function at this point here. Now, the, as far as obtaining the power delay profile, um, well, first of all, you can do measurements yourself, or more likely, you can resort to um, looking up uh, references and publications or in textbooks that will actually give you like either a plot of the power delay profile or a tabulation of, of the key values there. So the, that quantity itself is, is measured and reported in, in various publications. Now, a related quantity that's also of interest here is called the um, spaced frequency correlation. I know it sounds like I'm making this name up here, but that's, that's generally what it's known by. So 
So space frequency correlation is um, written as something like this here, Rm of delta of f. And it's just the Fourier transform of the power delay profile here. And what the space frequency correlation, the, the interpretation here, this delta f is a difference in two frequencies. So it's not the absolute frequency, it's a difference between two frequencies. And what this does is, this gives us the correlation in the power between the channel impulse response at two different frequencies. Assuming that you're looking at a very small temporal window where you can take like the Fourier transform. So this is something like correlation between the channel at two different frequencies. And this quantity here is interesting because if you think about like an OFDM type system where we're sending information in different parts of the channel, different frequencies of the channel, this tells us how rapidly that's changing as a function of the subcarrier here. So this, this quantity here is also useful, but you can get it from the power delay profile. And usually you see in the literature the power delay profile. So these are these, the quantities here. Now, we normally don't work with the functions themselves directly because, you know, that, that's a lot of information contained in there. So what we look at instead are different numbers that are computed from the power delay profile. So the first one is the, um, and this is the most important one for us, is the root mean square delay spread. And that's given by sigma tau. It's going to be in units of seconds. And it's the square root of I'll explain what these are. This is the second moment minus the mean excess delay squared. And so these quantities here, this, this is the second moment is tau squared here, which is the integral of tau squared s of tau d tau normalized by the first moment, which is integral from of tau, sorry, normalized by the, the energy contained in the uh, power delay profile here. And then likewise, this other quantity is the first moment, this tau bar, which is integral from zero to infinity of tau, sm of tau, d tau, divided by the integral from zero to infinity, sm of tau, d tau, here. And so, effectively, what this is, is this is the difference between the second moment and the first moment squared here, and it's the square root of that. What we are trying to do is we are trying to capture the extent of this power delay profile here. So, you know, you, because there can be many, many reflections, this power delay profile can be very long, but practically we don't have to consider its entire length. What we're trying to do is come up with some sort of an approximation of, well, this is about um, this, this is about the significant extent of that. And that's what we're calling this sigma of tau here. So it's, it's a quantity, kind of like a variance, not exactly a variance, but sort of like a variance that's, that's going to give us some number that corresponds roughly to the width here. You know, and so if you had a power delay profile that 
sort of decayed much more quickly, its sigma squared might be smaller, and if it had more energy, its sigma squared might be larger here. The normalizations in the denominator here, this is just the total area in the power delay profile. So we're just normalizing out the area. So that shouldn't really be a concern there. So that's the root mean squared delay spread here. We also define um, one more quantity, which is the coherence bandwidth. And that is typically defined as the inverse of the RMS delay spread. The rule of thumb is usually like five times the RMS delay spread, but it varies here. So typically, what we will want to compute from the power delay profile, or what we'll look up in a paper, or what you'll be given is the root mean squared delay spread or the coherence bandwidth. Now, finally, we need to do something with these metrics to determine if the channel is frequency selective or not. I mean, that, that at the end of the day is what this whole exercise here is about. So we say that a channel is frequency flat if the symbol time, which I'm going to write here, symbol time is much greater than the RMS delay spread, or equivalently, the bandwidth of the signal is much less than the coherence bandwidth. And so this right here gives us this notion of narrow band, because we are defining narrow band essentially as it's, this bandwidth is small relative to the coherence bandwidth here. Now, ha narrow band has a couple other meanings too, but this is like in terms of fading, this, we would call this like a narrow band signal. So the main punchline here is that we can use the RMS delay spread to help us define this boundary here. So we can put like, you know, sigma tau here. And then, actually, since I have signal bandwidth here, I could, I could equivalently put, actually, I'll just put coherence bandwidth here, B of C. Because I have bandwidth down here. And so large bandwidths you end up over here, and small bandwidths you end up over here. Now, I had this like much um, less than sign. So, you know, that's, that's subject to, you know, your own interpretation here. Let's see. Oh, here it is, here. Yeah. All right, so practically here, if the bandwidth, if the coherence bandwidth is like a megahertz and your signal bandwidth is 500 kilohertz, that's probably too close together. But if it's like 10 kilohertz, then that's probably sufficiently less. So th this is, you know, this is, this is a bit fuzzy here, but that's, that's just the way this is defined here. Okay, so any questions on this here? So if I ask if a communication channel is frequency selective or flat, you would look at the power delay profile, compute the RMS delay spread, and then um, compare that, and then maybe compute the coherence bandwidth and compare it to your, the, the bandwidth of your operating system. So if your system, if I just give you, let's see, I mean, you have to, so you have to know the bandwidth or the symbol period of your system. And you have to know there are something about the propagation channel to answer that question here. 
All right, so let's do uh, just a quick example here of um, an RMS delay spread calculation here. I apologize for cluttering up the, the lecture with an example. I'll try to avoid it. The, um, so consider a GSM system here. So a GSM system, if, if you remember uh, the discussion we had about the, um, the structure of the, uh, the training. The training was 16 plus 5 plus 5 wrapped around. The plus 5 was because it's designed to deal with up to 5 uh, symbols of uh, multipath delay. Now, at least one of those symbols is actually caused by the partial response effect there. So it's actually about four symbols worth of delay here. And so since the symbol period is about 3.7 microseconds, GSM, it turns out, is actually designed for about an RMS delay spread of about 16 microseconds here. <coughs> And so if we compare, you know, we can compare here, let's see. The symbol period here, first of all, let's look at the symbol period here. Is the symbol period much greater than the RMS delay spread? Well, it's, it's, it's not because it's much less than the RMS delay spread. It's already determined here. And then, you know, if you divide the RMS delay spread by the symbol period, you get roughly four here, which tells you roughly the number of channel taps. Usually you have to add a few more here. And so, you know, GSM is designed for actually five taps total. So I didn't give you, like, the, the measurement result here, but essentially they, when they were creating the GSM standard, they made propagation measurements at a whole bunch of different places, in cities, different countries, in rural areas, and urban areas. And there's a whole family of different channels that they call like typical urban, typical rural. And each of those channels has associated with it an RMS delay spread. It turns out that the worst of all of those RMS delay spreads was something on the order of this right here. It's actually, this is, this is quite large. If you think about this, this is um, a path delay difference of 16,000 feet, which is um, more than, little more than three mile difference, just in the propagation delay, which is it's a pretty big multipass. That means that, you know, you've got a, you know, perhaps a direct signal and a reasonably strong reflected signal that's coming in from quite far away. Um, and I'm trying to remember the discussion here of this I actually recall that this particular measurement came from the, the San Francisco Bay Area there, and they had some explanation for exactly why the path was coming in. It was like measurements in San Francisco reflected off of Oakland or something, though Oakland is further than three miles away, so it doesn't quite make sense. But um, you can actually get these strong multipaths. The biggest contributors, these big water towers, it's like in uh, the central U.S., you see a lot of these big metal towers there, and you can actually get really strong reflections off of them. So, all right, so that, that's an idea here. Now, you could also go, you know, the other direction here. So we could look at one over five times this. This would be, you know, roughly one over 90 microseconds. All right, I can't do that calculation in my head here. But we could also compare the coherence bandwidth, too, with the 200 kilohertz of GSM's bandwidth. Okay, so... That's kind of the, the checking here. Now, I want to summarize just the, uh, how we can estimate this, this quantity here. So I already mentioned before that. So we can, we can measure this SM of tau here by essentially estimating and averaging channel realizations. Well, I mean, you need to aver average the magnitude squared of those channel realizations here. So, I mean, 
practically, if you needed to compute this in a lab, you, you know, you'd make a bunch of measurements, store them, square their values, and average them up. I mean, that's, that's essentially it here. So you can measure it. Um, now, if you were going to do this measurement, though, um, you would ideally, let's see, I mean, ideally you'd have like a very wide bandwidth, but then if you have a wide bandwidth, you're going to resolve more multipasses. It looks more selective. So you have to do this, you know, in the bandwidth that you're going to be operating in. But, so I already mentioned that one. The other one I wanted to mention is the way to measure this space frequency correlation. It turns out that you can measure this quantity here by sending a sinusoid at frequencies f1 and f2, such that delta of f is equal to f2 minus f1, and then estimate the correlation in the resulting channel. So actually, really for this to work, you have to send two short sinusoids. Each sinusoid produces some channel impulse response times some carrier frequency, complex exponential. And this RM of delta of F here is roughly the correlation of these, the power in the channel here. And essentially what we're trying to assess here is, you know, in frequency, How related is the impulse? How, how related is the frequency response at two different points, f1 and f2? Because if they're highly correlated, then these two values are going to be close. And if they're not highly correlated, then these values are typically going to be further away. And so we're looking at, you know, families of realizations of of the frequency response, right? So this will be like, you know. So this might be. Yeah, I have to be a little bit more precise about this here. So we get, we're looking at, like, let's say one, one realization, and then we're going to say, on average, how correlated are these two points here, F1 and F2 here. And then we'll look at another channel realization, and we'll say how correlated are these points, F1 or F2 here. And then by generating a whole bunch of different channel realizations, you can use a sample average to estimate that correlation and to get this quantity here. Why I'm mentioning this is that sometimes, in, depending on how the system is designed, some systems for channel measurement, they operate essentially by sweeping a sinusoid. So instead of trying to send like a training signal and estimated impulse response, it's actually easier to send, send and sweep a sinusoid over time. And so in this way, you, you kind of get a picture of this response. And then they sweep the sinusoid again, and you get this response, and they sweep it again, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then you take all these measurements, and then you estimate the correlation by averaging them all up. So, and this gives us some intuition here about this. Okay, so that's like basically everything about frequency selective fading that I want to talk about. So any questions here? Yeah, question. I mean, varying the frequency but stepping it. So not necessarily like continuously. You, you could do it continuously too, but that wouldn't quite apply here. So it would be like, you know, send at one kilohertz two, for like a short period of time, then two kilohertz, then three, then four, and so on. Yeah. Okay. You mean, do you mean at, um, are you talking about taking two different, like an impulse response at two different times, or do you mean one impulse response at? Well, basically, we just need the impulse response, and we can measure it in, you know, we can try to, try to approximate it in continuous time, we can measure it in discrete time. And so if we measure it in discrete time, we end up with uh, a, well, I don't have my, I can't find the, the sheet handy here. 
But you know, we, we could measure it in discrete time, and instead of putting the continuous time here, I would just put n here, and then I would measure something like this here. And so we might call this like s of n here, for example. And so we would literally just you know measure an impulse response. And so you, you would assume a rather large L because you don't know what the length of the impulse response is. So we, so we would design a system, let's say, to estimate 20 taps of the channel. You know, so this might go down all the way over here to, let's say, 19 here. And then at some point, we'd find that they're like very small here. But we would, you know, we would measure in impulse response. So we measure an impulse response here. Then, then we send another training signal. We measure another impulse response, and so on. And that would give us a whole bunch of powers that we can average. So we would take this tap here, we'd square it, we'd take this tap and square it, and then the average of those squared values, that would give us this point here. And the second tap would give us this point, and so on here. And we would just compute discrete versions of all of this here. You can send the same one again and again. Um, so, when's, well, okay, one source of confusion here is that I, I have to assume that there's not a lot of time selective fading in the channel to measure the frequency selective fading. So there's a little bit of um, sophisticated stochastic processes detail that we have swept under the rug here. And that would be probably covered in like one of the um, other wireless classes here. But we have to use this concept called um, whites and stationary uncorrelated scattering that gives kind of a theory for modeling in a probabilistic way the time selectivity and the frequency selectivity. So I'm, tr I'm trying to avoid going into that because it's very technical. But, but in a sense, we, we're going to pretend that the system is not varying much in time. And we can do that if we send like really short bursts, it, it won't, the effects of time selective fading won't be there. So we send a whole bunch of training sequences again and again and again. We collect the channel impulse responses and then we average them. So. Yeah, and, and it, from my perspective, it makes a lot more sense to think about the power delay profile as being in here in discrete time. It's just that the, the convention in the, um, the propagation literature is, is to use this continuous time quantity. I mean, they'll estimate this, and then they'll fit a curve and, and plot it with seconds instead of samples. So that's just the convention there. Though this, from a signal processing perspective, makes a lot more sense to me. So other questions about frequency selective fading here. So again, I mean, to, to determine if the channel is selective, you have to know its parameters and the signal you're sending into it. I mean, if you don't know both of those, then you can't say if it's selective or flat. I mean, you have because you have to know the bandwidth here. So we could make um, another way to think about this here is that you could make a, a channel measurement over very wide bandwidth, let's say 500 megahertz. And then based on that measurement, we could decide whether we want to use all 500 megahertz, or maybe we want to divide it into 20 megahertz pieces or 5 megahertz pieces. And so there, we would measure at a much higher resolution than we perhaps intend to use. So that's also done typically in propagation, is you measure over a larger bandwidth than you're using. All right, so now we're going way too slow here, but uh, I'll take like a short break here. I was going to, you know, talk about something about or the other about the exam, but since it's not graded, I what's the fun in that, right? Um, actually, what I'm going to show you here is I don't know if any of you have seen this here. Apologies in advance if this is extremely disgusting. But uh, I, I mean, I have to say I read this article several times over the weekend, and I mean, I thought a lot about it here. So has anyone seen this already, first of all? No. Most of you have not seen this. Okay. Maybe someone here has seen it. So he, here's the idea here. Let me, um, this right here is a cockroach. There are these bugs that 
they're pretty disgusting, kind of big. Um, and I, I mean, really, I was looking at this for a long time, thinking, no, this is this is like a joke, but this is not April first. This is like this is completely serious. So this startup company is selling a um, a device that you can connect to the head of a cockroach, and you put a sensor in its little brain cavity, and then you replace its um, two antennae. And then you can use your phone, they have both Android and iPhone applications, to control the cockroach's movement. Yeah, I mean, seriously, I was looking at this again and again, thinking, no, this is, this is just a complete joke. Yeah, but I mean, I, then I went to the website of the company and everything. I mean, it's completely serious here. Now, OK, so some of the details here, let's see here. Um, yeah, so basically all you have to do is you have to put the cockroach in icy water to subdue it before sandpapering the waxy coating on the shell of its head. Then you put an electrode connector and electrodes and glue them on the insect's body, and a needle is used to poke a hole in their thorax in order to insert a wire. The antennae have been cut and electrodes inserted. A circuit is attached to their backs, and the signals are received through a mobile phone app allowing users to control the cockroach's movements to the left and right. Yeah, it's a lot of work to, uh, but, I mean, the payoff is huge because you get to drive this cockroach around the city, apparently. Uh, now, okay, so I, I read about this a little bit more. So one is that, um, so there's some sort of a cockroach farming thing that comes with this. So um, I, I was trying to understand how you get the cockroach, first of all. And they talk about having, like, a breeding colony. So I, I think that breeding the cockroaches is part of this whole game here. Another is that the cockroach apparently gets wise to the stimulus after about two minutes. You can really only control it for about two minutes. Then you have to put it back, and then it forgets in about an hour, and then you can play with it again. And then they said something like after about a month, it becomes completely immune to the stimulus. And so then they recommend you take the backpack off and you, you know, use it to breed more cockroaches. In the meantime, I suppose, installing it on the next cockroach in your family of cockroaches. And the, uh, oh yeah, and the company says that this is all about, um, what was this here? Um, it's not a toy. Let's see here, where did it go here? Yeah, I, I <laughs> one might think that with the name of Robo Roach, it is a toy. Ah, yes, here we go, here. Um, the backpack had been developed solely to encourage children to take an interest in neuroscience, which needed to be better taught in American schools. I mean, has anyone here taken a neuroscience course? No. So clearly, this is a problem, right? We, we have not taken any neuroscience course. So I guess, yeah, anyways. So I, I'm not sure what else I can say about this. Anyone have a comment on here? You think this is cruel or? Um, it's cool or cruel? Cruel. Cruel, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, two minutes. But then you get to control it again an hour later for two minutes. Yeah. But again, this is not a this is, you know, it's it's apparently educational, not not for just freaking out your friends by driving the cockroach around. So Not yet, but are you interested in volunteering? I mean, don't you have a military background? I mean, you should be telling us about this, you know. <laughs> What's in those backpacks those soldiers carry? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I, I they mentioned that there's research, you know, in, in the sundry neuropathic d disorders that this is apparently helping or something, so I guess the idea is that they would like to do this in humans, but more for the purpose of helping people who have lost some use of their um, body to help them get some use back somehow. So and I guess there's something to be learned here from a signal processing perspective on how the signals actually get generated and processed to the cockroach. There's apparently some, some details in there about like the pulse duration and stuff. So you can actually play with that also, which might be pretty cool. You know, we could do this in LabVIEW and we could, uh, you know, design different impulse responses and filters and pulse shapes. So, I mean, it does sound, I mean, there is some interesting, you know, 
wireless stuff here. Now the, now the actual com, okay, signal processing. The com stuff is, I think, actually that's another question I have too, is how are they controlling it here? Well, it's an app, but, but how does the cockroach get the signal? Is it Bluetooth? Is it Wi-Fi? I don't think it's got a cellular receiver on it. It's got to be, yeah, what's the range, too, you know? Yeah, I would kind of guess Bluetooth also. Hmm. It's got to be really low power. Bluetooth would make sense. Oh, look, it's got a light on it, too. Wow. Ah, that's a good idea here. Exactly. Now you're thinking here. Exactly here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, well, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, but if you put the camera on it, then maybe you can just watch where it's going without the controlling it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thought here. I don't know. I, I have sort of mixed feelings about this. I, I really find roaches completely disgusting. So um, the thought of handling it and putting this on is kind of repulsive to me. Um, is there what? Oh, I see. Oh, nice. Yes, hate food. There's good reason why. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, we can discuss that one next time. Hmm. All right. Anyways, that's what I found here today. In all seriousness, I did think about this for a long time because it just, it, the whole idea was repulsing me for, for quite a while. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not much for using animals for experiments in general, even the cockroaches. So I'm happy to smush them at my house. Okay. So with that, let's get down to this important question here of time selective fading. And this is important because you can imagine you're designing a wireless communication link to, for example, operate a cockroach. And that cockroach is moving over time. And so you'd like to know, is it moving fast enough so that I have to deal with, you know, time selective fading or not? And so that's essentially what this piece here is about. I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker. Um, with time selective fading, we have, we define two similar kinds of functions. One is called the space-time correlation function. And that is typically written as RD of delta of T. And that's the expectation here, it's over lag of H of T1 and H of T2. Something like this here. And this is usually measured over a small bandwidth so that you can assume that the channel is flat. So it's measured over small bandwidth. And the Fourier transform of this quantity here is called the Doppler power spectrum. And so I might write that as SD of F here as the Fourier transform of the spaced autocorrelation function here. Now keep in mind, for frequency selectivity, the power delay profile is defined in time. And we went in the frequency domain, we got the space correlation function. So here, we start in time with the space correlation function, and we get Doppler power spectrum and frequency. So there's sort of a duality here at work. So the, this um, Doppler power spectrum, so t this is actually typically what we use to talk about the mobility of the channel, is the Doppler power spectrum here. We can define those similar quantities like an RMS um, delay spread here, but normally in cellular systems, 
we use the maximum Doppler shift here is most common here. Instead of, you know, of RMS Doppler spread. Now, you can actually compute that. And so, um, and, and I think that using the maximum Doppler shift is not really uh, the best approach, but, but it is the most common approach. So that's why I'm going to stick with here. So to get the maximum Doppler shift, you just have to compute, you know, the product between the velocity, maximum velocity, the frequency, and the speed of light here. All right, so for cockroach, this would be how, how fast can a cockroach run a second? They seem to be pretty quick. Maybe 10 centimeters a second? No. One centimeter? No. It's got to be faster than one. But yeah, you would plug that in, multiply by the carrier frequency you want to use. is Bluetooth 2.4 gigahertz divided by speed of light. We would get the Doppler shift for the cockroach channel. Now, okay, so this is typically what we use here when we're talking about time-selective fading is actually we just compute this um, maximum Doppler shift. And so the maximum Doppler shift comes from the maximum operating speed that your system might want to support. So indoor wireless LAN, not designed to operate with very high Doppler. Outdoor cellular system, designed to operate with very high Doppler, you know, including up, up to the operation of high-speed trains even. So um, those two systems are very different. And if you take, you know, one system, for example, wireless LAN, and try to operate it, you know, in a cellular-like context, it can break down because it's too much time variation. So we use this here instead of RMS delay spread as a way to define the um, time-selective nature of the channel here. And so we, def we calculate what's called a coherence time, which is typically something like 1 over the maximum Doppler shift. Or if you had this RMS Doppler spread, you would plug that in there as well. So if your maximum Doppler was like 10 hertz, your coherence time would be 1 tenth or 100 milliseconds, which actually is kind of a, a long time. And so then we say that a channel is time invariant if... if this symbol period is much less than the coherence time, or equivalently, the bandwidth is much greater than this Doppler shift here. Now, here is also where I wanted to say that really what we care about is communicating like typically blocks of information or packets. So, so normally we define something like we require like K times t to be much less than t sub c here. So this is, say, like the, the number of symbols in a packet here. Because we want to be able to send, for example, 100 symbols and not have them affected by time variation. And so we would require 100 symbols per packet here. So that's actually... It's for Doppler here. Um, let me give another example here with GSM. So let's look at GSM supports different carrier frequencies. Let's look at the higher frequency, the 1.9 gigahertz here. And let's look at a high-speed train that's operating at 300 kilometers per hour. So now we have to do this usual um, physics trick here of changing the units, so it's one hour divided by 3,600 seconds times 1,000 meters per kilometer. And if I did the math right, which is 
very likely it did not. It's 83 meters per second. I don't know, that seems reasonable here. And so then we plug in to the maximum Doppler shift here, f of m, velocity times f of c over c. So we plug in and we get 83 times 1.9 times 10 to the 9th, divided by speed of light, roughly 3 times 10 to 8th meters per second here. So we get this. This cancels that. And then we get 3 into, this is 0 0.6. This is 83 times 0 0.6, which should give us, um, I think here, no, 83 times 19. Yeah, 6. 6 times 8. Yeah, about 500. Okay, I have my calculation here is 553 hertz. This is about 500 hertz of Doppler shift here. And so then dividing, we see that coherence time is roughly 1 over 553 hertz, which is 1.8 milliseconds. Now, does anyone remember the duration of a GSM burst? GSM burst, so the symbol period was 4.7 microseconds, 150, um, about 150 symbols. Turns out to be about half a millisecond. And so we can see here, if we compare, that the GSM burst is less than 1.8 milliseconds, though this admitted, admittedly is pretty close. So this is kind of like on the boundary of what can be considered to be time invariance. And it might actually be good to consider it a little more advanced equalization here. So we could probably argue that it's, you know, time invariant is okay here. I forgot to show this again here. Time selective fading, so determine when a given propagation environment is time selective or non-time selective. All right, so going back to the um, first picture that we had here. So here, we put like coherence time over here. We put coherence bandwidth here. And so the coherence time gets larger if we're going to operate in a lower mobility environment, gets smaller if we're operating in a high mobility environment, and then the coherence bandwidth gets larger if we're operating in an environment with um, very small path delays relative to the symbol period, and real, very large path delays relative to the symbol period here. So these are like two different quantities. So signal bandwidth, we're saying, assuming like, like the frequent, that the channel is constant in time, what is the average distances, difference in time between all those paths? Here is kind of like assuming it's constant in frequency, how rapidly does it vary over time? So these are kind of the two quantities that we, we use to determine which, um, in which region we're operating. And from the perspective of the wireless lab, you know, basically this is just going to tell us what is the right signal processing model and thus which algorithms to use here. So most systems are designed so that you can use one of these two here, right? And so how you design that you can't really pick the maximum Doppler. I mean, you could. If you want a cellular system, I suppose you could tell people, well, it doesn't work when you're driving, but that, that might not be very satisfying here. So then you have to play with the other system parameters here, in particular the, um, you know, like here would be the length of your burst here. So think about 802.11. You can have, you know, an Ethernet frame of 100, uh, 1,500 bytes Convert it into like the BPSK rate one half, you're going to end up with 
a rather large packet, like it's going to be, I can't even do the math here now, but something extremely long. And so that wouldn't work well. So if you make those, if you make the maximum packet length shorter, then eventually you could get to the point where you could push yourself to operate over here into the slow. So that would be, and then, and then over here, you can operate in flat case by making your channel very narrow band. Well, what happens if you make it narrow band? What happens to the symbol period? Symbol period gets longer. So you're shifting kind of back over here. So here, usually we, had, we, we kind of play with this here on the, um, to, to help us roughly determine the bandwidth. And then over here, we typically play with the length of the packet to make it um, slow fading here, at least over the length of that packet, which is what's important. All right, so that's essentially it here. So to summarize here, we had other sheets go. Hmm. All right. So today we talked about small scale fading. So you should be able to describe the factors that influence small scale fading, which essentially is this Doppler spectrum power delay profile. And you can see that you can use those par parameters to compute metrics of performance, RMS delay spread, maximum Doppler that you can use to justify the particular selection of a bandwidth and a number of symbols per packet here. So you should be able to compute the um, RMS delay spread, use it to determine if it's frequency selective or flat, and compute the time selective fading, determine if it's time selective or time invariant. And I guess that's it here. Any final questions? No, all right.